All right, so we'll get started. Our Joan's seminar speaker today is Ji Fang Lu. He joined our faculty in 2010. He got his uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in material science and engineering from Tsinghua University in uh, Beijing, China, and then his doctorate in material science and engineering from MIT. He is a uh, fellow of the Optical Society of America. And so um, his talk today is going to be about nanophotonics for sensing and sustainability. Thanks a lot, Ian, for the introduction. Uh, exciting uh, to talk in this room again. I haven't talked in this room for a while. <laughs> and see everyone, although it looks a little bit weird with, uh, with mask on and uh, with those depths of distance over here. Uh, so uh, my group is actually conducting work on light matter interactions. So that's why my students uh, give the uh, name for our group it's called Life of Light. And I like this name very much because it has the same acronym as Laugh Out Loud. So essentially this is a, a very uh, interesting kind of uh, research that we're, kind of, we're doing. Uh, actually, when I was preparing the talk, I used the wording uh, sensing and su uh, sustainability. And I realized this sounds something familiar which is uh, this famous novel, Sense and Sensibility, uh, Sensibility <laughs> published like 200 years ago, uh, and, uh, written by Jane Austen. But there's a big distinction here between this one and, and the talk today in that this is a fiction, uh, although it's a great fiction. Uh, what we talk today is uh, strictly nonfiction, although some part of it may look like a fiction. For example, we can introduce some uh, color to the single layer of carbon atoms known as graphene. So we'll show you how this trick actually works towards the end of this lecture. So hopefully everyone stays to the end. Okay. Uh, so talking about light and humanity, we have a uh, natural light source, which is the sun. And then many years ago, our ancestors made a big, big uh, discovery of how to harness in fire, basically uh, for warmth and also for, for lighting and scaring away all those animals. So basically light has played a dramatic role in our evolution. For example, our vision has been adapted to the solar spectrum. Uh, our eyes are most sensitive to the green light, which is also the peak uh, emission spectrum of the, sol uh, of the sunlight. So essentially, you know, uh, the sunlight not only has the visible light, it also has infrared and UV that we cannot really see. So the first topic I'm going to discuss is to, uh, it's about a light matter interaction to visualize the invisible. So essentially, you know, your cell phone camera can actually pick up the photos in visible regime pretty well. Uh, Professor Fossum and I are collaborating to integrate other materials such that we can utilize to that to image X-ray as well as infrared light. And also, we know that the uh, science delivering energy to the Earth. So uh, essentially, uh, except for the uh, geothermal and uh, nuclear energy, pretty much uh, all the pieces of energy delivered to this planet is from the sunlight. Uh, and basically that's the food we eat, the fuel we burn, etc. So uh, the second topic, we're actually going to bring this to a, a higher level. Basically, we're trying to harvest sunlight as, at high efficiency, but also, uh, you know, giving us the pr uh, chance to store the energy relatively cheaply so that we can do dispatchable solar electricity. And the last but not least, you know, we have been using light for communication since ancient times. Whether it being uh, west or east, we have been using fire beacons uh, for a very long time. It's certainly much faster. It's a high tech at the time. It's faster than the horses, right? So that's the uh, very fast communication. But uh, in modern days, we're actually communicating like billions of bits of uh, information per second. So that, that way will be very uh, slow. So what we are doing is actually we're trying to modify the materials, optical properties, essentially reflect index and extinction coefficient using quantum structures and even 2D materials uh, to do this more efficiently. And eventually we can probably also, uh, you know, if you find the right material, we can also probably do this 2D material display using this. Okay, so before I talk about all those applications, let me give you some uh, basic ideas about what's really happening when we have light matter interaction. It's very similar to uh, pushing uh, the swing. <laughs> so essentially, if you know your frequency of pushing the swing is uh, resonant with the frequency of uh, intrinsic frequency of the swing, then the kids will be very happy. So essentially, you couple, couple that energy efficiently. Uh, essentially, in light matter interaction, light is electri uh, electromagnetic wave. It's an oscillating electromagnetic field, very high frequency, you know, uh, 200 uh, uh, terahertz and above for the visible light. 
And if you look for X-ray, that's 10 to the 18 hertz. So uh, many, many oscillations per unit time. So therefore, only uh, the charges that can oscillate fast enough can actually respond to those kind of uh, 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 oscillating field. So that's why you're interacting with the electronic transitions in materials. So essentially, we have a parameter called refract index, and scientifically to describe it. So basically, you probably know uh, the refract index of water, you probably have the index of glass. That's the real part of the refract index. And that's basically, uh, uh, it's talking about how easy it is to polarize the valence electrons and their oscillating electromagnetic field, uh, and how easy, easy it is to oscillate those electrons. So if the valence electrons are weakly bound to atomic cores, they're easier to polarize, essentially to get high refract index. That's why when you go down the periodic table, the refract index tend to increase. The second part, the imaginary part, is talking about basically the, the dissipation. Essentially, you're having some friction. You have seen some energy losses in the process. And that's due to the excitation of an electron from the uh, ground state to excited states. And that part of energy from photon is being absorbed. And that introduced this imaginary part called extinction coefficient. So let's take silicon as an example. So this little dot symbolizes valence electrons between two silicon atoms. As you know, each pair basically forms this covalent bond. And if you have a photon coming in with high enough energy, uh, in this case it's uh, greater than 1.1 electron volts, you can actually set one of those electrons free. So essentially this electron carries negative charge. This deficiency of electrons is called a hole, carries positive charge. Essentially that, when they move, they can actually generate electrical current. That's the fundamental physical principle of solar cells and photodetectors we use today. Of course, you can also collect those photoelectrons, put it on a capacitor, and measure the voltage change. That's essentially how your cell phone camera works. And essentially, that's, uh, you know, Professor Fossum's dimension is related to that part. So essentially, you can see uh, all you need to do to get the light matter interaction is really to matching all those resonances. You can either engineer the material electronic structure itself to actually uh, get different resonances, or you can put different materials together uh, as uh, basically like pieces of uh, Lego. So essentially you put different materials together, they introduce interfaces, and that will introduce another layer of resonance with the uh, input uh, photons. So that's essentially the nanophotonic structures we're going to talk about. So here's a very nice uh, connection to essentially what we were talking about in the first topic. How do you visualize the invisible? <laughs> So, you know, we can actually do the visible light pretty well with silicon uh, image sensors to carry in your pocket. Uh, that's because if you look at a visible spectrum regime, the uh, absorption of silicon is very strong uh, near the peak. However, if you go to longer wavelengths below the band gap, well, the photon doesn't have enough energy to excite the valence electron uh, so it's free to, to generate free carriers. So essentially, uh, the uh, absorption in the infrared regime is very weak. In a very high energy regime, uh, it's another, it's a similar case. Basically, the resonance frequency is actually, the, the frequency of the X-ray photon is so high, there's no resonance in the silicon atoms anymore. Even you look at the inner, innermost core, which is the closest to the nuclei, because the atomic number of silicon is not very large, so attraction is not very strong. The energy is not, binding energy is not very large, so essentially the frequency of resonance is not high enough to resonate with, with those X-ray photons. So that's why we, we come to hard X-ray uh, detection, basically this absorption of silicon also decreases. So the question is, can we actually integrate some other materials to silicon to actually make them universal X-ray, UV, IR image sensor extend to the full spectrum? So uh, we'll start with the X-ray part. So basically this is the high frequency part. Uh, we all know the applications of hot X-ray imaging, you know, uh, we can get the dental imaging, which we do every uh, six months or so. And, uh, but essentially the sponsor of this work is uh, Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, they were actually interested in using the powerful synchrotron X-ray sources, uh, what they call advanced photon source, to analyze the uh, dynamic process in material processing. And this is, this case is 3D printing of the metals. So essentially they want to capture the process of uh, uh, spatter of the uh, metal droplets within a microsecond regime. So essentially, as we know, we cannot really directly use silicon to detect the X-ray photon efficiently. So what people use is what we call a scintillator. So you first down convert the X-ray photon into visible light, and then you detect it with things like your camera. Uh, but essentially, there's a little bit of problem here. First of all, you see this is a really exotic material. I believe most of you have never even used this, this uh, 
never know this element. <laughs> uh, lutetium uh, is basically uh, a rare earth element, and essentially uh, it has to be made into a single crystal like this, because otherwise the light emission efficiency is not very high. So when you make this, uh, it produces 33 photons per keV of X-ray photon energy. So that again creates some problems. For example, if you have an X-ray source coming here, you suppose, supposedly should hit this pixel. But now you're generating uh, on average 33 photons randomly in this piece of crystal. So essentially that emission direction is really random. Uh, and essentially this uh, causes problem of uh, reduced spatial resolution. And if you uh, detect high energy X-ray, basically this needs, needs to be thick around one millimeter. So if your light source is higher, essentially illumination area is bigger. So essentially you, you get a sacrifice in the spatial resolution here. And then there's another one, which is the time. Basically the decay, decay time of this luminescence is about uh, uh, 40 nanoseconds. But if you really, uh, really want to capture a really fast process below a nanosecond, then this becomes a problem. So our solution to this is that we can stick to the silicon image sensors but let's integrate something that really resonates with the high energy X-ray. In this case, you're looking down a periodic table, uh, looking at those big atoms. The big atoms are important here, not because they're heavy, but because they have a lot of positive charge uh, on, on the nucleus. So we have a lot of positive charge, basically the innermost shell, the K shell, has a very strong attraction uh, with this, and essentially the binding energy is large and then you get a high frequency resonance. So it can interact strongly with the hard X-ray at greater than 10 kilo uh, electron volt energy. So essentially uh, our candidates include, uh, of course, lead, but lead is not so healthy, you know. So eventually when we do the experiment, we use a compound called bismuth telluride, which is uh, much safer to use. So uh, to using this one, we are not converting the incident X-ray all the way down to visible photons, but basically just decreasing that energy to a few kilo electron volts, such that silicon can absorb much more efficiently. Because we don't need to down convert energy all the way down to a few electron volts in the visible regime. So this layer thickness is very thin compared to what you see in the previous slide. So previous slide is one uh, millimeter. This one thickness is one micron. So essentially you can resolve that spatial resolution problem. And also uh, you don't need to use single crystal because essentially you're counting on the atoms in the atoms uh, resonance. Uh, you don't care so much about defects in the materials. No need to use single crystal, you can directly deposit. And also this uh, scattering process, uh, basically energy down conversion process is due to photoelectron generation and Compton uh, scattering. Those are much faster than what you get in the luminescence uh, in the visible regime. So we can potentially get into the picosecond scale in terms of time resolution. So uh, my student, Eldred Lee, who actually just graduated uh, last fall, uh, actually did a uh, simulation on this. This is Monte Carlo simulation, M particle with X-ray photons. And this uh, actually, he was doing internship in Los Alamos and get to learn this software. So essentially, uh, basically our, in this case, our incident photon is 20 kilo electron volts uh, right here. So without a down conversion, you can see uh, silicon, this absorption curve is here, dash red line, barely any absorption at all in silicon. But after this, uh, uh, passing through this, uh, 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 what we call pale layer, photon attenuation, photon energy attenuation layer, which is also a great name uh, given by Eldred, you know, with this pale, you can actually reduce down the photon energy. You can convert many of those photons to low energy in a range between one kilo electron volts and five kilo electron volts. And that, ma that matches the absorption uh, capability of silicon much better. But here you have more absorption coefficient from the silicon. So that's essentially the idea of this down conversion process. And basically, uh, Eldred further done, have further done some simulation comparing uh, silicon pixels response to hard X-ray photon detection without pale layer and with pale layer. Same color means the same thickness of silicon absorber. So you can see, uh, sure enough, you can actually see a factor of 10 to 30 increase in detection efficiency, uh, which is quite dramatic because you can actually integrate this very thin layer uh, in a very uh, uh, facile approach, but the effect is very strong. So uh, basically this case is the quantum yield is like the number of primary high energy photoelectrons you produce per, per incident photon. And then uh, eventually this high energy electron will further impact other valence electrons, starting an avalanche or cascade process, produce more. So basically uh, there's a, a semi empirical equation basically saying that it takes about three times the Banyat energy to produce one electron by impact analyzation. 
And uh, Professor Fossum's students, Caitlin, actually analyzed this in a more uh, systematic and rigorous way and proved this is actually uh, uh, true. Although there's some energy dependence, uh, but it basically the variation is very small. So roughly it takes about 3.6 electron volts uh, by impact ionization to generate uh, another electron hole pair in silicon. Okay, so how does this compare to scintillators? So this is uh, again Aldrich's analysis. It shows that basically with our current uh, pair layers at photon energy below 25 keV, basically uh, they perform better than scintillators. If you go to a higher energy like 50 keV, the efficiency, quantum efficiency is decreased to some extent, but you get the benefit of higher spatial resolution and also faster response time. So still it's a pretty good uh, trade-off here. So the next step is to demonstrate this idea. So this work was uh, uh, done actually during the pandemic time. So I very much appreciate all the efforts from the chip designer, Xin, who's working with Professor Eric Fossum. He designed a chip and also the test board, essentially on the electrical engineering part. Aldrich took over with the help of uh, Professor Levy, uh, the microfabrication of the pale layers, and also uh, did X-ray measurement. So the X-ray measurement was supposed to be done in Los Alamos National Lab, but uh, due to the pandemic, they, they were closed. So we find the closest <laughs> light source we can find, which is also relatively safe. This is actually in, in Dr. Sean Robinson's lab in MIT. So, uh, 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 so, so Aldrich actually spent uh, back and forth about two weeks there to do the measurements. Uh, so the first thing you want to check is, uh, do you actually get enhanced absorption with the pale layer? So this is the case of 44 keV X-ray photon. It's a silicon reference. You can see it looks very dark, but this is one with the 250 nanometer pale layer. It looks much brighter. So basically it means the photo response is much stronger. Uh, the next question you ask is that, is this due to the photon energy attenuation that you promised? Okay, so interestingly, this, uh, this light X-ray source is actually uh, triggered by the radioactive de de decay of americium. So basically you'll see the X-ray actually counts in pulses. These are a few frames that, that basically captured here over here. So when you get the pulses of X-ray uh, coming in, you can count the number of electrons received by each pixel because you can convert the uh, voltage signals read into the number of electrons, uh, you know, in the capacitance of, uh, of each, uh, each pixel. And then essentially you can uh, actually do a histogram to plot the, uh, uh, how many uh, electrons you have collected. And using uh, Caitlin's uh, results, you know, 3.6 electron uh, volts per electron, you can back out what's the incident energy of X-ray photon that you receive at the silicon pixel after the incident 44 keV pass through the pale layer. So you can see there's a strong reduction in the photon energy from 44 keV uh, below uh, to some, somewhere below, below uh, 10 keV, and it's mostly in a few keV regime. So that explains why you can actually absorb the photon more efficiently in silicon. Uh, and here's basically a summary. So essentially, <laughs> uh, Aldrich tested different thickness of the pale layers. There's some variations. Uh, you know, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the X-ray source, especially at different wavelengths, may not be strictly monochromatic, so uh, may not be fully calibrated correctly. So uh, these lines are just to get, guide the eyes, but essentially you can see overall you get about a factor of 10 increase in the quantum efficiency, which is uh, consistent with our theoretical modeling. So this is basically the quantum efficiency comparison. So as you can see the trend is consistent. Uh, the numbers, absolute numbers are roughly consistent, but the absolute quantum efficiency will be redone uh, in collaboration, collaboration with Los Alamos to get the more accurate numbers. And also we need to analyze the crosstalks between pixels, the resolution, et cetera. That will be the work of uh, my <laughs> undergrad students, Kevin Larkin, who's doing a honor thesis with me uh, in spring. Okay, so, so far we've been talking about the X-ray case. So how about uh, going to the infrared case? So when you go to the infrared, uh, essentially what you're, uh, the challenge you're facing is to, is to try to get a, a material with smaller band gap, essentially looser bond between the valence electron and the uh, atomic core. And as I mentioned, interestingly, you also go down the periodic table because when you have big atoms, essentially the valence electrons are further away from the protons, they're less attracted. So interestingly, they're good for both X-ray because they interact with the inner core electrons and the infrared because they interact with the outer shell electrons. So in this case, to be compatible with silicon, we hope to use germanium and tin because they're really more compatible over here. 
And with that infrared detection, uh, we should be able to see things we cannot see uh, with visible light. For example, this is a case with seeing through the haze, seeing through the smoke to some extent with short wave IR. And here's a picture with the long wave thermal IR. Uh, interesting thing you see is that your lenses, glasses, which is perfectly transparent in visible light, uh, becomes opaque in long wave IR. And that's because silicon dioxide basically absorbs light at greater than 3.5 microns. So essentially this becomes black. Well, uh, your thermal radiation from your arm actually, you know, penetrates through this black plastic bag, actually come out, pre pick up pretty well over here. <laughs> So uh, there's a caveat to this, uh, this approach because uh, for material scientists, the first thing uh, you want to check is, you know, I want to use this material uh, as an alloy, germanium and tin. Germanium has a small band gap, 0.666 electron volts. Tin is essentially a semi-metal. So it essentially means a zero gap. But essentially, uh, you know, somewhere in between, you should be able to get the band gap you, uh, you desire for infrared detection. But the question you want to ask is, do they actually mix? Unfortunately, if you check the bulk phase diagram, uh, very, very unpromising because it says that uh, by extrapolation to low temperature, uh, your germanium can dissolve about 1% of tin, and tin rarely dissolve any germanium. <laughs> so that's basically uh, not good. So you need to find some way to actually uh, break through this uh, the solubility limit. So if, if Shakespeare is looking at this figure, he will say, to mix or not to mix, that's the question. Okay, but do you have a chance? Actually you do, because the uh, tin at higher temperature, you have this metallic structure, uh, this is a uh, orthogonal lattice, and the lower temperature is diamond cubic lattice, which is the same as germanium. So maybe you can play some tricks over here. And the tricks we, we play is actually uh, first uh, uh, demonstrated by my previous PhD student, Hao Feng Li. Uh, we basically deposit amorphous layers of germanium tin. So basically it means that the unit cells are really not aligned. They're basically random orientations. It's a metastable state, high energy, and then we will anneal it when it drives this to the solid state. Instead of driving this from liquid, uh, you know, solidification process, we found that you can actually crystallize the material very well. Uh, the figure here is not very clear, but can you see the green boundaries uh, in the SEM? Scale bars one millimeter. Uh, what's interesting is that thickness is only 300 nanometer. So usually when crystallized uh, semiconductor thin films, the rule of thumb is that the thickness is comparable to the green size. Here you get the green size much, much, much greater than the thickness. So essentially that means the nucleation is relatively slow and lateral growth is really fast. And that fast lateral growth is enabled by this eutectic phase diagram where once you above this eutectic temperature, you introduce a tiny amount of tin droplets, uh, liquid phase, that enhance the uh, atomic diffusion at relatively low temperatures. And once the tins uh, segregate, they are on the surface, you can actually etch it, etch it off with uh, hydrochloric acid. So essentially using this approach, we can also uh, grow on a smaller area where the crystallinity is much better. You don't have the large angle green boundaries anymore. All you have is the coherent tin boundaries. And you may want to ask, you know, can I further increase that composition? You know, you get about 14% in this direct crystallization approach. That's pretty good. But if you want to push the detection to even longer wavelengths, you probably need more tin. And that's exactly true. So we try our <laughs> another trick right <laughs> here. The other trick is that, you know, what you worry about in this material is that when you heat up the film, the tin is going to segregate, right? But when it's going to segregate, uh, what you learn in Andrews 24 is that it's going to undergo a nucleation process. Initially, the energy is going to increase because you're creating new interfaces with, uh, between the old phase, old matrix and the new phase. So initially, this will increase. And for whatever nuclei that doesn't reach the critical size for nucleation, they will have a tendency to be redissolved into the matrix. So uh, we said, okay, how about you do the opposite? <laughs> we start with some really tiny T nano uh, particles and we bury this into a germanium matrix. And then you have so many interfaces according to thermodynamics to minimize the uh, total energy. Those guys will be forced to dissolve back into the germanium matrix. And then you could get high uh, composition germanium team. So uh, this experimental work was done by Alejandra in collaboration with Lisa. Lisa was actually an uh, honor thesis student at the time. And essentially, uh, they found this to be true. So essentially, if you, if you look at the schematics, the first step is to look at uh, the tin deposition. We have an X-ray defection pattern showing very clear beta tin peaks, uh, very well crystallized. You can tell the orientation. Uh, 
And as we put down this amorphous domain layer, this is deposition is uh, slightly above the room temperature, maybe like 30 degrees or so during the uh, thermal uh, evaporation. But essentially, after this deposition, amazingly, this beta PMP peak is already gone. Instead, you see a broad peak over here that's kind of shifted from the pure polycrystalline germanium peak uh, to the left. That means basically it's cooperating tin. So the lattice constant is getting bigger. You can see it's mostly amorphous because the peak is broad. But after some annealing, uh, amazingly again, you don't see any beta tin segregation. You actually see everything dissolve and crystallize in this case. You also see some polycrystalline peak over here. Uh, so we took some cross-sectional uh, uh, SEM uh, and also the EDS mapping, so basically trying to look at the X-ray emission from the atoms to identify their identity. And we find that basically the average composition can uh, reach about 26%. And near the interface, because we have more uh, tin dots at the beginning, so this, uh, this, this part is actually more tin rich over here. And you can do this kind of deposition multiple times and doing the uh, kneading. Supposedly, you can actually get high tin composition here. Uh, more recent progress is another uh, interesting thing, is that not only you can tune the composition in tin, but actually we found that it, it matters whether you put those tin atoms in a cluster or you spread them out. So basically, let's say you want to put those five tin atoms into germane lattice, you know, uh, does it prefer to be clustered or does it to prefer to be spread out? If they have no preference of who, who is the nearest neighbor, then it's called a random alloy. But if you do have a preference, either prefer, prefer tin atoms to be the nearest neighbor or prefer germanium atoms to be the nearest neighbor, that's what we call short range order. So the theoretical work was done by my collaborator, Professor Tianshu Li, and uh, basically he shows that there's actually a dramatic difference between the random alloy and the uh, uh, short range order alloy once you get above the temp composition about 15%. So if you have random alloy with about 23% tin, uh, the material is already a semi-metal, band gap is gone. But actually with the short range order, you still have like 0 0.3 to 0.4 EV band gap over there. So this is quite interesting because you can get exactly the same material, same crystal structure, you know, same composition. But if you distribute the atoms differently, it matters who are your neighbors. So if you choose the neighbors in a different way, you get a different band gap. So this is a quite interesting uh, result from this uh, study. So we then try to do some experiments to uh, quantify this short range order. So this is some preliminary work we have done with atom probe tomography. Uh, basically it's a technique to measure the atomic species uh, and positions by mass spectroscopy and time flight, and also the, the detector rays to back up what's the position of the atoms. A caveat here is that uh, uh, the technique is not perfect. You're not going to reconstruct a perfect lattice as you do uh, in, the, in the real crystal. Uh, there are some perturbations to the atomic positions. Therefore, we use a fixed physics informed statistical method to actually map this. So this alpha parameter basically tells you, you know, if it's equal to one, it means germanium tin, ha uh, tin has no preference between germanium and tin being the first nearest neighbor. And if it's greater than one, basically you can say that tin pre have some tendency of preference being, having tin being the first nearest neighbor. And if it's below one, that basically is kind of de declustering of tin atoms. So basically we can do this kind of nanoscale mapping and 10 by 10 by 10 nano cubes. And basically you can see some very interesting contrast uh, in different in regions. So now we're kind of systematically studying how is this sort of range order dependent on the growth conditions and how can we actually engineer this? So if you can engineer this, basically you can use the same composition, perfectly lattice match, but achieve different band gaps and different quantum structures. So uh, those are basic ideas and, uh, and ways to engineer those materials. And then how about the devices? So it's actually, this is a, a preliminary demonstration that can actually make a heterojunction with uh, between P-type germane tin crystallized on N-type silicon. And this is the IV curve. You can basically see the duct current is relatively low, comparable to the level of the epitaxial germane on silicon for the diodes we've grown before. And uh, the photoresponse, uh, this layer is relatively thin. So basically the photoresponse is not very high, uh, but it's starting to reach the order of magnitude of commercial uh, lead sulfide detectors. So quite recently, in the same batch of running the X-ray image sensors, we also uh, tried to run the germanium tin integration on silicon. Uh, there's one little problem here, which is basically in the first run, we are utilizing a chip uh, that's standard uh, uh, image sensor where you actually put a barrier there on the surface. This is to prevent the photoelectrons generated in silicon 
from diffusing to the surface and recombining with the defect. However, the same barrier also prevents photoelectron transfer between germantine and silicon. So in our first trial, we basically utilized this run as a way to testify that the processing actually still works. But after all this thermal processing, crystallization, deposition, essentially your circuits underneath still works. Uh, and essentially the dark current is still low. So essentially uh, we found this is quite interesting because we found instead of getting any uh, increase in dark current, we actually get a factor of six de decrease in dark current. After you did all the this thermal processing, you know, evaporation, uh, annealing, uh, we're not exactly sure about the reason yet, but we're having a second batch of uh, chips that will come out, uh, come back in three weeks. Uh, basically in this case, we partially removed the special barrier there such that photoelectrons can uh, diffuse from germanium absorber to silicon storage well region. They can be transferred to a capacitor and you can read out uh, the, the voltage. So I think within uh, uh, one or two months, we should be able to get those results. Hopefully demonstrate a short wave uh, infrared uh, image sensor on silicon. And a few words about what this is ultimately going. <laughs> so uh, this is a challenge a few years ago from a DAPA project. Uh, basically, they were asking the question fundamentally, how fast can you detect, uh, detect a photon uh, once the excitation happens? You know, in conventional detectors, you have a conduction band, you have valence band, the photon comes in, you generate the electron hole pairs, they actually drift and the electric field. There are always some time needed to transport the charges. So we asked the question, can you actually detect a photon, read out the electric signal without even moving the charges? Uh, and we did some analysis. <laughs> uh, interestingly, theoretically, it's kind of possible. Let's say you have a, a quantum dot in the arsenide quantum dot, and you can end dope it such that there are few electrons in the conduction band. So if you, if you, like, uh, uh, if you have an uh, electron wave function in the ground state, it looks something like this. If you have ex get to the first excited state, essentially uh, they will move to the side lobes. So essentially the most probable position of the electrons will indeed change between the two cases. And if you put a probe very, very close in the vicinity, a few nanometers, from those quantum dots, you should be able to measure a potential change because in this case, uh, you're closer in R average to the electron charge. And in this case, uh, the R2 is actually a little bit further. So you should see, uh, because the electron has a negative charge, so in this case, you should see uh, increase in the voltage potential readout. So that's basically a, a, the fastest, fastest way you can actually detect this. So uh, Professor Fawson and I collaborated on a paper uh, talking about this effect. But we find that to get this done with a device, this, uh, sim this MOSFET, the circuit needs to be very tiny, it needs to use the state of art, so which we cannot access. But I'm really uh, uh, you know, looking uh, into some collaborations with Oxford Instrument, who can actually first demonstrate, demonstrate this concept with uh, conductive AFM tips and also optical excitation. So that's something uh, we're going uh, further, trying to directly utilize this effect to probe the wave function at the excited state or you measure the difference between the wave function in the ground state and excited state. Uh, so basically that's, to me, is quite exciting thing because wave function, starting from the time I learned this as a student, it's a very, very elusive concept. <laughs> so uh, you can talk about it, uh, you, you, you hardly ever measure it. You measure the energy levels much more frequently than the wave function itself. So if you get a way to measure the probe of the wave function, that, that's actually quite interesting. Okay, so the second part we'll talk about is energy harvesting. Uh, in this case, harvesting solar energy, but also provides some capability for energy storage. As you know, in the last uh, 10, 20 years, basically we get a great boost in the solar uh, applications. So we installed a lot of PV panels. So, uh, but then also create a kind of problem. So this is uh, basically the famous Californian uh, duck curve. So basically it means that during the, uh, in the middle of the day, in the afternoon, you get so much uh, PV production that you can really reduce down your uh, conventional uh, uh, non-renewable resource uh, production uh, in the middle of the day. But the problem is that when the sun sets, you have to increase this uh, energy you know, production by, by fossil fuels very dramatically and very quickly. You need to ramp up 13 gigawatts of power in three hours. That's a lot of load on the electricity grid. So essentially, if you can actually store the solar energy in a cheap way, you know, you could use the batteries, but batteries are expensive. So if you can do this in a very large scale and in low cost, that will help to resolve this problem. So over the years, this stock is growing, lar growing larger and larger. And uh, so people must find some solutions. So one of the solutions, uh, you know, <laughs> is actually 
It sounds like it's not that high tech. It's, it's saying basically, let's harvest the solar thermal energy. Let's focus the sunlight to some tube that contains a working fluid, uh, uh, heat it up. But the really great thing is that we've been known how to keep hot things hot for more than 100 years, <laughs> right? So it's very low cost for energy storage. Nowadays, we can actually do this for large scale for the over 10 hours with 99% efficiency. That means you lose 1% of thermal energy over 10 hours, which is great. So we actually can harvest solar energy uh, during the day at noon and uh, use it at night. Uh, over the years, their first generation was this parabolic trough system where you can actually get a concentration of solar, uh, solar concentration about uh, 100 and reach a temperature about 400 degrees. The second generation is basically using this power tower system. You point the, uh, the mirrors to the, t uh, to the top of this tower and basically heat up more efficiently. This one can reach about, uh, in principle, uh, 650 degrees, but most of them are actually operating around 550 degrees. Uh, it's actually, uh, this is uh, uh, the second generation. In the third generation, DOE is looking for us to increase the temperature to 750 degrees, and that will allow uh, you to get 50% power cycle efficiency. And compared to the best lab results for the concentrated solar cell, that's about 47% efficiency. So you're going to get more efficient, and also you're going to be able to store this solar electricity for this fashionable electricity. So what's the solution to this duck? Well, physically, we just roast it <laughs> with solar thermal. <laughs> okay, uh, so essentially, there are different components in the system, as you can see. There's a lot of uh, you know, material science, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, optics going into the system design, uh, but we are really working on the solar coating part. So the solar coating, as you know, I usually you want to think this has to be a black coating, right? It's all, all the light. But uh, the other thing is that when you heat up this coating to 750 degrees Celsius, Basically, you know, from black body radiation, the stuff will look, uh, you know, red or even orange, and it's going to radiate out energy. So that's not good, no good, because whatever thermal radiation you get out is going to decrease your efficiency. So you want something that really looks black in the solar spectrum regime, but you really want to something that's hopefully, you know, if not perfect, if not perfectly white, at least should be gray <laughs> in the uh, in, in the uh, long wavelength regime, in the infrared regime. So essentially, this is uh, uh, the ideal case. You want to make a cut between the solar spectrum and the thermal radiation spectrum, uh, and that cut is somewhere around two microns, and that will actually allow you to get a much better efficiency because you can maximize the solar absorption and minimize your thermal emittance over here. Of course, the solar concentration ratio uh, plays a role here because you can collect sunlight from a bigger area and uh, emit in a smaller area. That always helps. Okay. So uh, there are, of course, existing technologies on the market you can actually deal with. Uh, so for example, this is the Pyromark uh, coatings, works pretty well up to 650 degrees. But once you go above 700 degrees, uh, we have tested this, it degrades very quickly. Essentially, it doesn't sustain the cycling. Uh, Sandia National Lab has developed this multi-layer coating, which works pretty beautifully at the beginning. But once you endure this uh, test at uh, 700 degree, for about 500 hours, the efficiency decreased from 90% to 80%. And this is a, a, a Spanish company, CMAT, actually produced multiple layers of coatings. Uh, very beautiful, uh, uh, but actually we, uh, we got this from our collaborator, Norwich Technologies. We tested it at high temperature. It turns out that the uh, platinum reflector actually does get oxidized at high enough temperature. <laughs> so essentially, uh, uh, these are not quite working uh, for very high temperatures. So our challenge is to address both the optical challenge and the thermal stability at high temperature. Uh, but this is, fortunately, we have started this work uh, quite a while ago. At that time, we we're actually just asking the question, can we actually get the solar selected coating with some very inexpensive method without using the well, well, very well controlled film thicknesses and get interference effect, just use some kind of resonance with the nanostructures, can you actually selectively absorb the solar spectrum? Uh, and essentially, this was done uh, early on back in 2012 or so, already nearly 10 years. So we basically say that essentially you can turn this shiny nickel, uh, if you break that down into nanoparticles, essentially it's going to be changed totally uh, black. Uh, that's because essentially, in this case, by controlling the size, you know, your longer wavelengths, you can, essentially you can see it doesn't resolve those nanoparticles. So essentially you still feel this like continuous uh, layer, so they're reflective. Uh, not being absorbed, but essentially uh, wavelengths uh, that are comparable to the size of particles. 
you'll see the gaps will actually interact, will get multiple scattering, and eventually get absorbed. So those are essentially the uh, cross sections for uh, absorption, scattering, and extinction, which is sum of the two versus wavelengths and particle size. Bigger particle size, as you expect, can shift the resonance to longer wavelengths. Uh, so essentially, uh, from here, we can actually calculate the scattering uh, cross section and put it in a model called four flux model. Basically, you calculate the diffuse and uh, uh, specular uh, forward. Uh, trans transmissive uh, flux and also backward reflection flux. The four fluxes you can actually cal capture to calculate the uh, reflectance spectrum of those coatings. And those turns out to be matching the experimental results pretty well. At that time, we we're really looking at intermediate temperature. So we chose nickel because nickel is relatively robust to oxidation uh, and also some silicides. However, once you go to 750 degree, <laughs> the, uh, the metals pretty much, much will not work, will not survive the oxidation. So you say, okay, how about we just, uh, instead of using transition metal, let's use the transition metal oxide. And actually this takes a little bit of effort to, uh, to try uh, a different kind of stuff because unlike uh, many of the semiconductor materials or metals, the N and K, the basic parameters of uh, transition metal oxides are not really well documented uh, uh, ex experimentally. Actually you can find much more data on the magnetic properties, the optical properties. Uh, so we actually did some trials. So Al did and uh, Tan did uh, uh, quite a bit of work to explore what are the possible particles. And we land on the spinel structure. You can see this is a pretty big unit cell. So essentially here, uh, the, our best uh, recipe now is having the copper, manganese, chrome oxide over here. And in terms of absorption spectrum, we can understand this transition in the visible light regime very well. So we collaborated with Professor uh, Hautier and uh, his postdoc actually did some calculation. This actually uh, more or less uh, uh, matches the, uh, the band gap calculated theoretically. But this infrared absorption that really helped us because it extends right to about two micron before it rolls off. This part is uh, still controversial in terms, in terms of fundamental understanding. So some literature from chemistry journals say this is interionic ionic charge transfer, uh, but we consider maybe it's actually due to the uh, cation disorder. Basically, the cation is exchanging sites in the crystals. So this is still uh, being investigated. Uh, but the bottom line is that uh, this actually works pretty well. So essentially, we plot the uh, overall efficiency contour, contour map versus the coating thickness and the nanoparticle volume fraction. So uh, nanoparticle size is about uh, 30 nanometer in diameter, which can be fabricated using chemical solution approach. What you can see is that from our kind of champion, uh, uh, copper uh, manganese chrome oxide spinel structure, you can see even if you vary this concentration between five and 10% and thickness between like six microns to 15 micron, your thermal efficiency is all very high. It's above 95%. So that means basically you can use very cheap coating techniques like spray coating. You don't have to be precise. You have a large margin to, uh, to, to live with, but still get the same kind of results in terms of optical performance. So that's actually uh, quite encouraging here. So, uh, so basically, Tan went ahead and uh, produced those particles, basically using co-precipitation method and also some sintering. So essentially, you produce all those oxide nanoparticles. Here are some uh, TM images. Here are some diffraction patterns. Uh, occasionally, you can actually see some lattice images because the lattice constant is really big. And he she dispersed this in a silicone matrix. And silicone is actually, we selected, uh, we screen uh, different kinds of silicone and find those that can survive high, high temperature, also with low thermal emittance. And then we spray coat on the substrates. So that's essentially what we get. And you can see actually science work is uh, quite, uh, you know, takes quite a lot of time because later we have to do the endurance testing showing that the solar technology office of DOE that this actually survives in a very long term uh, the, uh, cycling process. But first we can see there is indeed compared to commercial uh, coatings, we already have increased this uh, solar absorptance from about 96% to 98%. But more importantly, reduce that emittance quite dramatically. So the uh, commercial uh, coatings almost uh, non-solar uh, reflective uh, not, so, not solar selective, meaning that it's basically uniformly absorbing all the way to infrared regime. But in this case, basically, we, uh, in our case, we can actually get uh, solar selectivity over here. This peak is actually due to the silicon oxide matrix itself, and we're considering better matrices to get rid of this peak uh, too. Uh, 
Okay, so here's the endurance testing. Uh, we also code on the curved substrates and measure. This is actually uh, a, a get, uh, basically an attachment that uh, Tan designed. So basically, you can flip this piece over so that curvature will perfectly match that one. So you can put it on spectrometer so that you don't get any uh, uh, straight light in the measurement. So in this case, you can see this is 24 hour at 750 degree. This is 24 hour after 10 day night cycles, 40 day night cycles, 60 day night cycles. Essentially, there's no spalling on the surface. The surface looks good. Uh, look at the efficiency, keeps high. This is about 94% all the way across. That's essentially a, a, a very successful kind of coating development here. And uh, uh, last year, last spring and summer, Tsai also uh, went on to show that this is scalable. So basically, she coated a 48-inch uh, long tube by spray coating. And this is uh, in collaboration with Norwich Technologies. We did some rough testing, you know, how much solar energy is being converted, comparing the, uh, the reference power mark and the two kinds of coatings we developed. As you remember, basically with chrome, we should be able to get slightly better performance than iron. And, uh, okay, this is white river junction. So essentially you can see all the solar illumination versus time. You can see the clouds come in. So, so you have to find a, a, a region, a time scale where relatively the curve is flat and compare the efficiency. And indeed, you see about 20% improvement uh, in this efficiency compared uh, in our chrome, uh, 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 copper manganese chrome oxide nanoparticle coatings. Okay, so uh, I still have about, uh, you know, a little bit of time. I'm just going to quickly show you in the last one uh, about the communications in terms of modifying the refractive indices by changing the electronic transitions in materials. So, of course, it's very interesting to manipulate all those uh, <laughs> refractive indices one way or another. You can do this with, uh, for example, thermal uh, uh, tuning, that's called thermal optical effect. You can heat it up, but usually, it's very, very slow because you know, dissipating heat is relatively slow, typically on the order of uh, microsecond scale. Can you do this actually faster? Actually, there are ways to do this faster. So for example, you have a semiconductor material, you have this band gap. The photon energy uh, that's smaller than the band gap typically will not be absorbed uh, in the semiconductor. But how about apply electric field? So once I apply the electric field, basically here is, let's say it's high potential, uh, here's low potential. Basically, the electrons carry negative charge, tend to go to the positive part, and the energy is decreased. So you can see, interestingly, although this photon energy still does not have enough energy to promote, promote the electron from the valence band to the conduction band at the same location, but you can do a little bit of uh, this tunneling. You can actually move this way and tunnel to the conduction band slightly away from that original location. That satisfies the conservation of energy, and this tunneling set actually is totally allowed <laughs> by quantum mechanics. So essentially, this is, uh, this is a process where you can actually change the semiconductor material from uh, transparent to opaque near its band gap. So this is essentially uh, how we uh, utilize uh, to actually change the refract index of the material. And if you put this in a sandwich of what we call quantum well structure, one with bigger band gap, one with smaller band gap, you can confine the electrons holes in the smaller band gap regime. regime. This change, this effect is even more pronounced and you can reach a uh, change of refract index on the order of 0.1. So you may think a you know, 0.1 index change is not a big deal, but actually for most of the optical devices, if you can change this by, by 0.01, that's already pretty good. <laughs> you can already do a very uh, good uh, modulated device based on it. And in this case, we can, uh, you know, utilizing this relatively large uh, index change, we can do a very tiny uh, modulator. This is about five micron in diameter. And basically, uh, you can see that when, uh, uh, when there's no voltage applied here, no electric field, the quantum well is transparent, the light hits the uh, field field on the, uh, on the bottom, and mostly get reflected back. So basically, it's transparent overall. Uh, but if it couples, if you turn on this electric field, not only the multiple quantum well is opaque, but also due to this refract index change, you match the uh, propagation of surface plasma on the surface of this gold film. So essentially, you dump the energy not only to the absorption of quantum well, but also to excite the charge oscillations on the surface of gold. So that increased your extinction ratio here. So that's essentially what we demonstrated in the last couple of years. Of course, you uh, want to ask the question, fundamentally, how much N can I change? How much delta, delta, delta N can I get? So essentially, the 2D material provide another kind of opportunity. 
So essentially, this is the uh, band structure of graphene. You can see it looks very weird because it looks like a cone, you know, uh, and the two cones actually meet at the uh, point that's called the rock point. When there's no voltage applied on this intrinsic uh, graphene, basically it can promote electron from the valence band to the conduction band. But note that it can only go vertically because you have to match the momentum conservation here. So it's like uh, the photon comes in saying, I can promote you by 10 floors in the hotel, but you can only go from 1010 to 2010 uh, in terms of room number, you know, cannot change that last two dig digits. Okay, so now if you do some what we call electrical gating, that basically means that you put two layers of graphene in a parallel capacitor configuration, you remove a few electrons from this hotel, uh, move them to this hotel over here, the other side. You see that basically uh, I still, uh, the photon can still promote you by 10 floors, but essentially they find no guests in this hotel anymore. So basically the photon is transparent. And here, the other hotel, you already fill the, the 20th floor. So essentially, even though you have a coupon for promotion, you have nowhere to go. <laughs> so essentially after you do the gating, the uh, graphene becomes from uh, opaque to transparent. So basically your uh, K will change very dramatically. And that will also transfer to a large change in N. So note your change in uh, refract index is from 2.5 to 1.5. That's on the order of one. So it's very dramatic change. Even more interestingly, so uh, my student uh, Tao Fang is working on the possibility of utilizing magic angle graphene. You probably heard it nowadays, uh, there's a hot news that if you overlap two graphene layers by a tiny angle misfit, you know, overlapping this, like your fingers, essentially you're going to see some, uh, you know, essentially overlapping interference pattern uh, over here, and that will change the electronic states of the material, especially at low temperatures. <coughs> In Taofan, uh, basically, if you do this trick on the uh, magic angle graphene, you're really converting this to a kind of metal because your K is really big. Your N is pretty small after gating. So it's the opposite compared to the case of uh, single layer graphene, where you're actually changing from uh, absorbing to non-absorbing, means uh, semi-metal change to a dielectric. So they work in opposite ways. So essentially, he was considering putting this synergistic together. And that actually builds upon our previous work, uh, you know, of enhancing the light absorption in single layer graphene. Because the problem here is that the, 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 uh, the, the 2D material is too thin. So uh, I'll increase the pace a little bit. So this is actually the next scientific part I just want to briefly mention. So essentially you can utilize the slots between two high index material to confine the light into a very small slot. And that's due to the continuity uh, you know, requirement uh, at the interface of Maxwell's equation. Electric displacement has to be continuous in the normal direction if there's no surface charge accumulation. So that means the, if you have low dielectric constant, then essentially your field and interface will be have, have to be high. If you put two of those interfaces really close to each other, you get a strong field enhancement in the slot. Of course, the best thing you can do is to insert those graphene layer into the slot. You get a really strong enhancement in absorption, uh, but that actually turns out to be more difficult to fabricate. So what we did is that uh, we put the graphene essentially on a uh, uh, dielectric cavity. So aluminum mirror on the bottom, dielectric layer, graphene, and then we deposited some self-assembled T nano dots with very uh, narrow, narrow gaps around 10 nanometers in between. So essentially after you do this deposition, you can see a dramatic change optically. So the graphene on silica uh, is almost transparent, absorbs about 1.5% of incident light. But once you put on over, over here, depending on the thickness of the silicon oxide layer, this is 100 nanometer thick, this is 150 nanometer thick, you can see not only the intensity contrast of the light, but also see the color contrast. So that's essentially due to this uh, funneling of the light through this nano gaps into the cavity and strongly interact with this very thin layer of graphene right underneath this thin uh, nano dots. So we call this a structure optical antenna uh, coupled cavity or optical sac because Look at the power flux. It looks as if it's sucking the light through the gaps uh, in the same way as you suck uh, ink into this fountain pen set over here. So except this is sucking the photons in. And then you get very strongly enhanced absorption in a graphene layer. Uh, this one looks red because you can see basically because of the absorption uh, of, the, uh, of the graphene, you, you actually get a strong absorption peak in the green light regime. So that's why the co composition color red is being reflected over here can actually get a, a strong contrast right here. So Tao is currently uh, doing some design, coupling this uh, magic angle graphene and graphene into this cavity. 
So without applying the electric field or gating, this layer is absorbing, this layer is absorbing, both enhanced by some nanoparticles that funnel light into them. So basically you get a relatively uh, low reflectance at the surface. But once you turn on the electric uh, uh, voltage, basically uh, this front side graphene is becoming transparent. The back side is becoming a metal. So that's why you get a very strong reflectance over here. You get a reflectance change about uh, 70%. So this is in the infrared regime. So if you can find uh, materials that work in the visible regime, you can e even use 2D material for display. Basically, you turn the light on and off, you can change the color instead of using liquid crystal. So that's basically some in interesting direction we are looking into. So I'm a little bit run over time, so I'm going to conclude over here. Uh, so hopefully I have convinced you in this talk that there's plenty of room to light up the bottom. According to adapting Feynman's famous saying, there's plenty of room at, uh, at the bottom in terms of any engineering nanostructures. So here we're really engineering resonances between the photons and the electrons in both uh, photonic materials and also their nanostructures. So essentially we're controlling all those resonances to, uh, 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 for applications in optical sensing. Uh, let us see the X-ray, UV, and IR photons. We can harvest the solar energy efficiently and uh, we can store it uh, as heat. Uh, so basically we can get special solar electricity. And also for communication, we can actually change the refractive index by tuning the electronic states by electric field or essentially just moving charges by gating. So essentially those are three examples we can apply those, uh, those uh, uh, basic principles. So you can see this is really fun background to play with. Uh, and I would like to acknowledge some of our, our other collabor collaborators I haven't mentioned. So Professor J.J. Hu's group collaborated in the modulator, quantum well modulator uh, uh, design and fabrication. Uh, Professor Fisher Yu in University of Arkansas, we have done some during teen lasers on silicon. Uh, we don't have time to talk about it. And also a lot of collaborators internally uh, with Professor Baker and Professor Hodier. We have two projects, one on thermal electrics, the other on high entry alloys. Uh, both are very interesting. Uh, with Professor Jason Staus, we have uh, we had a project on the delivering power through laser shining on a photo, uh, 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 photovoltaic cells. You can generate hundreds of volts of power uh, of voltage in that case. And Professor Sullivan is actually supporting this TEC effort, uh, uh, basically is, uh, in the electrical pulse meeting. And I'm collaborating with uh, Professor Xia Zhou in the computer science department on white laser lighting and Li-Fi communication at the same time. And uh, our uh, 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 microscopy center director, uh, Max uh, Gunnell, actually helped a lot with training all my students with all those microscopy tools. So I'd like to thank all those uh, students that I haven't mentioned uh, over here, um, uh, uh, Dr. Julian uh, Wang on the UV detector, and uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Katrina Kaklo on solar coating, uh, and Dr. Wei Ding Dong, uh, and uh, Corey Klein on some electric materials and also all the funding agencies. And thanks for coming on site. Thank you very much. <laughs>